Good evening, Saints. It's Wednesday. I was going to wait to do this tomorrow, but I was doing some study for something else, and I came up with some new information. So if this sounds like I scrapped what I was going to do and did this instead, you would be right. But it fits so well with what we were doing, and it's along the same theme, then I wanted to do this instead. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23. We will finish the sixth chapter tonight. There is so much in here. And it's about our union with Christ. And we've spent several weeks on it now. But I hope I have whetted your appetite, or the Spirit has whetted your appetite, to do even more study in this. This is a central passage. It is hardly preached on, mainly because preachers don't believe it. They just don't believe it. And yet, God says it. So if He said it, it's true, whether we believe it or not. It used to be a bumper sticker. It might still be available if you look hard enough. They said, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It's not true. God said it. That settles it, whether we believe it or not. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Abba Father, we thank you so much for your grace in our lives. Every day as we walk with you in the power of the Spirit, we find out how much we need grace every day. On our best days, we need grace. And on our worst days, we need grace. We ask that we would hear the soft sound of sandal feet tonight. That we would see Jesus in Him only. We pray these things in His magnificent name. Amen. Now, the wages of sin is death. Wages is something we earn. Unless you're a volunteer, when you work for somebody, you expect to get paid. And it's the amount that you and the employer agreed on. I want to refer back to a passage in the fourth chapter of Romans. We're going to look at a few verses tonight. But in this one, Romans 4, 1 through 5, What shall we say then? That Abraham our father has pertaining to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something of which to glory, but not before God. For what said the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Now you'll notice in this passage the word counted and imputed and reckoned or used. They all mean the same thing. It means put to the count of. So um, it says, first of all, Abraham, um, if he was justified by works, he had something to glory of, but not before God. Why? Because none of us are accepted before God by our works. He might could tell somebody over here, I'm better than you are, so my works mean I'm better than you are. But that would save him before God, would it? No. He says, what says the Scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted or reckoned or imputed unto him for righteousness. What did he believe? We're told in Galatians that God preached the gospel to him, the good news of the coming Savior. And in John we're told, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. 
I don't know how much of the gospel God preached to him, but he preached to Abraham the gospel, the good news that Christ died for sinners. And we know Abraham was a sinner, and he was called out of Ur by grace, not because he was such a good guy, but because God called him by mercy and grace, and he believed God, and God counted it, or reckoned it, or put it to his account, his righteousness. What? His faith? No. What he believed. He believed in Christ. See, we think faith is what saves us. No, we're saved through faith, but Christ saves us. What He did. And so, our wages apart from Christ are death because we're sinners. But I want you to take a notice of something here in 623. The wages of sin. One sin. He didn't say the wages of sins or even the wages of sinning. He said the wages of sin. What is he talking about? He's talking about what Adam did. Remember in the fifth chapter, we found out we were lost not because we sinned, but because we were in Adam and therefore we were sinners. We came into the world sinners. And because of that one sin, everyone in Adam is a sinner. And that's what Paul is repeating here, that the wages of being in Adam is death. No matter how good you are, how bad you are, it's death. Eternal death. If you die in Adam, you are eternally lost, you're eternally cut off from God, and you will be punished eternally. Now, it says, the second part of the verse, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is He talking about? What is the gift? Well, I've got this blank paper here. That is not the gift. I want you to look in um, Luke, the second chapter, Luke 2, verse 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is Jesus. He comes in the world. He's God incarnate. The Son had always been. He's eternal like the Father and the Spirit. One God of essence and three in persons. And I don't know how they arranged this, but we are told that God the Son was to come and be the Redeemer. That's the first promise in Genesis 3, that the seed of the woman would bring the Savior. And it says four things in this verse about Jesus. One, He grew. In other words, He came as a human being. He came as a baby. He was totally dependent for a time on His mother and father to change Him, to feed Him, to get Him from place to place. Then he became strong as he grew in age. But he had what do they call it? age pains where your muscles grow and you get tired and that kind of thing. Just like any other human being. He did all this without sinning. But he became strong as a man and became a carpenter. And then he was filled with wisdom. At the age of 12 he was teaching the religious leaders in Jerusalem because he didn't have to make mistakes. He got it. When God told him, when he read the Word of God, it came to him naturally. And he had the favor of God upon him. And we've seen in chapter 6 of Romans that it's about our union with Christ. What Christ was doing was being like us. He was growing and maturing and becoming a man. He had to go through everything we did. He even had brothers and sisters and he didn't sin. He did everything like it was supposed to be done because he didn't have a sin nature like we did. We also see in Hebrews the second chapter, which is likened to this. It says, um, But we see Jesus, 
who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every person. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. So what the author here is saying because Christ became a man he shed his glory. In other words, he didn't have a halo or anything when he was walking by. He was veiled in flesh and he grew up as a person and he limited himself to being a human being. And that was a suffering for him. Remember, he made everything. He created everything, and yet he subjected himself to the care of his mother and father in infancy, to society as he grew up and learned to trade. And he did this for 30 years. A lot of people think, well, he, the three and a half years were important. No, the first 30 years were important because he was building for us a life. And then we see in Hebrews 5, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. This is remarkable. He was the son of God, and yet he learned obedience. Not by trial and error, Everything that he did, he brought into subjection to the Word of God as he was growing. He, without making mistakes, without sinning, he did this. He's a tough act to follow, isn't he? And we're told to follow him. And then uh, Paul said, if I, had, if I could brag, I have a lot of things I could brag about, about my heritage of being a Jew. But he said, I'd give them up. Why? Philippians 3, doubtless, and I count all these things of my past as loss for the excellency of knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but refuse or trash that I may win Christ and be found in Him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ righteousness which is of God through faith. He counts all his achievements as lost. In other words, as Paul tells us in Romans 6, when we come to Christ, we die to who we are. We're not the captain of the football team or the, the head of society anymore. No, we become under new ownership, the ownership of Christ. Doesn't mean we can't use those things, but to us, they don't mean anything anymore. Christ is everything. So we found in these verses that Christ was made perfect through sufferings. Before his public ministry, he hid himself willingly in Nazareth for 30 years. You know, where Nathaniel said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was not the place that uh, bred heroes and and brave people and notable scholars. But it was a place where Jesus grew up and the greatest person, human person that ever lived, came out of Nazareth. He for us suffered. He lived and loved each day for 30 years for us. He did it joyfully. Have you ever been told to do something and you did it but you didn't like it? But it says Jesus joyfully did it because that's the way we're supposed to be. And yet we fail every day. He fulfilled the law in our place because through our life we failed every day. On my best day, I, I probably can't count my failures to do. And when I say fail, I mean we miss the mark. It says all have sinned and the word they used is miss the mark. What's the mark? Perfection. You say, well, nobody's perfect. Yeah, one was, Jesus. And that's good news for us. But none of us are perfect. On our best day, on our best act, we're not perfect. He was earning a human righteousness. You see, 
if we needed only righteousness, Christ could have come down like, say, Tom Cruise got off his spaceship, did a couple of miracles, go in there and let Herod execute him or Pilate and die on a cross and rose again for three days. No, that wasn't doing the will of God. The will of God was to obey Him in everything. So He came and all the failures, all the things we don't do, all the sins that we've committed, Jesus did those for us. Not committed the sins. The undones He did. The sins He obeyed. You see what I'm talking about? All our failures, He made up for them in His life. Even His baptism was for us. Luke 10, 27 says this, And He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as yourself. That's a 24-7, 365 day a year thing. From birth to death. If you did all that, you wouldn't die. And then we're told in Matthew, listen to this, Matthew 5, 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. I don't know about you, but I haven't for a nanosecond been as perfect as the Father in heaven, but Jesus was as a human being. He was that way from eternity, and He came and He did it for us perfectly. Every sin that we've committed, He joyfully shunned. You know, the ones we joyfully committed, He joyfully shunned. Everything we left undone, He did. To bring us to glory, He loved God with all of His heart, soul, strength, and mind. Every day. For 33 years, He did that for us. You know, he did this in Nazareth in an unremarkable town. Not standing on the street corners as the Pharisees and scribes did and said, Look at me. No, he did it in private. And during his public ministry, he did it in public, but he did it in the way it was supposed to be done lovingly as his ministry. His life exceeded the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees because He had told people, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you, you failed. And because He did it, that's good news. We see in Romans 3, there is none good, no, not one. None that is righteous. None that wants to seek God. But thank God there was one that did all. His obedience was from His heart. His pure heart. The heart untainted by sin. And it was done in adoration and faith. Like I said, sometimes we do things we're supposed to do, but we don't do them in adoration and faith. Maybe we do them out of fear. Maybe we do, do it to be seen. Our motives are not pure. But He did this. Well, this perfect righteousness has two purposes. One, qualified to pay for all of His people through redeeming them from death and the devil. And He also appeased God because He became the perfect sacrifice, a propitiation and expiation. He took our sins away as far as the east is from the west. They're gone forever, forever, forever. We earn death. He earned life. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, Choose this day, death or life. Do this and live. Do that and die. You sin and die. You look to Christ and you're saved. Not one of those people that heard that in Deuteronomy ever, ever lived one second up to what God says. And not one of us has any in ourselves. You see, innocence is not enough. Jesus not only came to 
earth innocent, he lived a life of joyful obedience for us. His suffering was not for his sin, though. When he died on the cross, it was for ours. And because he paid for it, it's paid for it. It's gone. His record is ours. He earned obedience and weakness as a human being. Now I want you to look at Romans 5.19 real quick. For as by one man's disobedience, many were constituted sinners. That's Adam. So by the obedience of one shall many be constituted righteous. Because Christ obeyed, we're righteous. Why? Because it is imputed, it's reckoned, it's put to our account as a free gift. You cannot earn this. How do you get it? You open your empty hands, drop your sins, drop your self-respect, come to Christ and say, I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And He will clothe you with that righteousness that Christ purchased for you by obedience. Receive it. That's it. It's when somebody gives you a gift, you open your hand and you receive it and say thank you. That's what it means to come to Christ. Come as you are. Don't make excuses. Just say, Father, forgive me, a sinner, and be merciful to me. And that's a prayer. He will answer. I would like to leave one more passage to you, especially to you saints. I know this has been mostly to persons that might be hearing and yet have not come to Christ. But this passage I want to finish with is to you. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His good will, working in you that which is well pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in grace and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.